It's getting down to it. We're less than a month away from training camp, and we have to get the update of what's going on, what we should expect from Matt Derrick at Chiefs Digest, what is going to happen in camp that's coming at you today on Locked On Chiefs. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked On Chiefs podcast. Welcome back, friends and neighbors. This is Locked On Chiefs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for free on every platform. And luckily, we get to add Matt to this mix. I'm Ryan Tracy, the founder of Rogue Analytics and Performance Consulting, as well as the founder at NFL33.com, where you can get league-wide news. Um, I, I take my cues from this guy, if I point the right direction. <laughs> this is Matt Derrick from Chiefs Digest. And this is the quiet part of the season, Matt. We have to look forward to less than 30 days now where we'll have veterans on the field. How exciting is that? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the absolutely the quiet before the storm. And when mm-hmm. I say quiet, I mean, not a whole lot going on right now. I mean, I know people are going to be reading about probably about the only thing in the NFL that's going on with the Deshaun Watson hearing. But other than that, no one else is anywhere. I mean, everybody else, if you work in a front office or you're a coaching staff or you're a player, um, you're on a beach, you're fishing off the Florida Keys, you know, you're somewhere skiing in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, you're anywhere but in Kansas City right now, probably. And certainly, you know, not on a football field. This is vacation time. So it's the quiet before the storm, but we're not far away from that changing. I mean, after after the fourth holiday, that's when everybody starts to get back into the office. Um, so the, the personnel side and the coaches will start getting back in. Certainly the equipment managers are back in because they got to pack up for camp right uh, right after. The, I mean, they're, they're already working on that. They're putting the trucks together now. So um, they're going to get ready to hit the road because we won't be in, we'll be in St. Joe. What? Basically that three weeks from now, basically. That's crazy. In fact, I, I know how you feel because I, I talked to a, a pal that I made a couple of years ago when I was down in the Caribbean. He still lives down there on one particular island, and he claims that he's seen a couple of guys that we might recognize. Um, not going to give anybody's vacation plans away. Uh, certainly, it isn't Mahomes since he's got a new uh, baby to plan for, and he's spending time in the pool, so good for him. But a couple of other guys that I think it is that prime time, and like you guys can see, I'm in a secret location here, uh, uh, the studios west, as I'm preparing to move. But right now, it looks like. I might get moved into my new house before we hear about Orlando Brown, which is the the first domino to drop. We're we're 18 days away now from the deadline. Does this feel like, again, it's going to be right at the deadline? The closer we get, the more we expect to wait? Or do you think that something's ticking away that maybe didn't get that done earlier? I mean, I would certainly expect that there's something bubbling behind the scenes. I mean, we haven't heard anything from either side. And, and, Honestly, at this point, no news is good news. I mean, if, if no one has blown up negotiations or decided to go public with something that's going wrong right now, then that's a pretty good sign that at least there's nothing happening. Uh, but at, at this stage, I mean, it's unlikely that there's anything in person. I mean, you're talking about just phone calls and texts at this point, which you can certainly do from anywhere in the world. So mm-hmm. the fact that it's the quiet time doesn't preclude that. But again, you know, this is a little bit different deal, you know, with with Orlando having the brand new representation. Um, that's going to, you know, I, I was certainly going to add some time element to it anyway. I mean, unless this was an easy deal of uh, both sides just magically came together, but that's not the way that these deals work. Mm-hmm. And normally deadlines make deals in the NFL. So I, I still think that the most likely day to, the, the deal gets done is July 15th. The <laughs> second most likely is July 14th. And it just goes on and on. Um, but I'm I, honestly, I'll be stunned if we hear anything before around July 9th and 10th. I mean, that's when I feel like it's probably going to start heating up and we'll start to maybe hear some buzz. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly not. after. I wouldn't think until after the 4th that we really start to get some in-person discussions and a little bit more hardcore negotiations that maybe are going on behind the scenes. I, and I hope that, you know, while Orlando's on the beach somewhere um, relaxing, I, I think you put it the best way. In this case, no news really is good news, because if somebody was trying to posture or, or trying to drive the price one direction or the other, we'd see things leaking out into the, the public. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's and, you know, and we saw a little bit of that, at least when Orlando, you know, hired his new agent. You know, there was a little bit of a. Uh, press, you know, move by them. I mean, they certainly they did a few interviews and did some discussions. But since then, I mean, it's been pretty shut down. I mean, I know Orlando had an event here in Kansas City um, that was, uh, you know, for, you know, working with Children's Mercy, but had no discussion whatsoever 
of football, no discussion of the contract that wasn't on his agenda that day, you know, deferred any questions on that. Um, so from that standpoint, it's radio silence. And you're right. I mean, at this point, if we're not hearing anything, that's generally good news because it means that things haven't gone south and somebody wants to talk about it. I, I like that plan. And I, I have this feeling that I'm still optimistic it gets done, like you said. It's probably the most likely on the 15th. But if it doesn't, that franchise tag is out there. I, I just want to calm everyone's nerves. A, is there any way that this goes on and Orlando doesn't sign that franchise tag and doesn't come into camp on time? I mean, is there? Sure. I mean, it, but it, how likely is it? I mean, to me, it's it's single digits percent. I mean, it's just it's not a likely scenario. Um, now, we've seen it happen. There have been a handful of times in the NFL when it's happened. And if anyone can point to me the time that it worked in favor of the player, feel free to tell me, because I, I can't think of a single one where it's really worked in favor of the players, certainly, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. If anything, most of the high profile examples have blown up in the players' faces. So, no, I mean, and and there's things that the, you know, the team can do. I mean, now, technically speaking, the player can only play under a one year contract. He doesn't have to play under the tag. You know, the Chiefs can entice him. I mean, if it's something that he doesn't want to play under the tag, the Chiefs can certainly pay him more in 2022 to get him to sign mm -hmm. on the bottom line. So, you know, it doesn't close all the options. But once again, I mean, even then, you know, are the other options, I mean, if things completely fall apart, the Chiefs could trade Orlando Brown. Is that likely? No. I mean, once again, I mean, I put that in the low single digits as being an outcome. The most likely, most likely outcome is one, either they get a long-term deal done or Orlando plays under a one-year deal for 22. And I, I, everything else, there's plenty of other, there's a handful of other options, but I just don't think that any of them are anything to worry about right now. Well, if you feel that strongly about it, I'll be the one to say, no, there's no way it doesn't get done. So either it'd be done or it'll be on the tag, in my opinion. So we'll get to that. And if I was going to bet, I would bet that. But I do it at Bet Online, your number one source for all of your betting needs for info, podcasts, everything that you need for every sport, even the ones that are done now. Uh, NHL, who's going to be the next Con Smythe, that's one of the bets you can make right now, as well as all the football prognostication that you care to. You can get it all at Bet Online. It's the best spot for all the scores, podcasts, and help that you need for just this sport, but everything else, as well as MMA, golf, even craziness that goes on. Check out Bet Online, it's where the game starts. So Matt, outside of Orlando, the one kind of contract thing that we're really waiting on, it comes down to competition. And I, I for one, feel that competition for this team in particular, this roster this year, is probably paramount towards getting the better outcome than what they had last year. Where it was a, it was a battle. You know, the, the two games against Cincinnati down the stretch were, were obviously not able to be overcome. But I think they also showed some chinks in the armor as well. So. For the sake of this team, what's the top battle that you're going to watch in training camp to see who can come out on top and actually make an impact for the 2022 Chiefs? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question because, I mean, I, I think that there's going to be a certain level of competition outside of quarterback. And and I, I, that's actually probably the only one there's not a whole lot of competition. I mean, there's going to be probably a battle for the number three quarterback. And that's about the most you could say at that spot. But everywhere else, even if it's for backup positions, there's going to be some you know fierce competition. Probably the, the, the tough thing for Chiefs fans is that the position that you'd like to see the most competition, which I think is the defensive line, there's not a lot there right now. I mean, I don't, I don't, that's not a, a, a position group that I'm watching a lot for a competition. It's going to be more about just how that group has developed and where they are health wise and all of those things. Position wise, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that to me, the, the, and especially early in camp with what you can do, it's going to be wide receivers and it's cornerbacks because that is two groups where you've got some turnover, you got a lot of new faces. And there's those are the positions that you can easily establish yourself in the first few days of camp. I mean, it's going to take until you can get the pads on before you can really start. You know, I mean, hey, you can look good at linebacker the first three days of camp, but it doesn't matter until the pads come on. You can start, you know, positioning yourself and players have already positioned themselves in that pecking order based off OTAs and minicamp at receiver and, and, and cornerback. I'm just really intrigued because, you know, even though we've talked about the fact that we feel like there's four players at wide receiver who are going to make this team. And, and I think you can probably say the same, that there's three corners who are going to make this team. The rotation is, is completely up in the air 
at both those spots. And I'm really intrigued about the position the battles on down because I think that those are going to be the fiercest that we see. Um, watching some of the young guys, I mean, you know, I really want to see what Jalen Watson's got. Um, DeAndre Baker's going to be tough at a corner spot. I mean, there's even though I think Rashad Fenton, just based on being the incumbent, is going to be, you know, your number three corner at this point going in. There's still a lot of competition. I mean, he, he can he beat out McDuffie and keep him at bay as you know not starting on week one? Yeah, it could happen. I mean, he's going to have to have a good camp to do that, and I think McDuffie would have to struggle. But that's what you're going to see in camp. It really see at the very beginning is how those guys are settling in. Th- those two positions off the bat are definitely what I'm going to be watching day one. Yeah, uh, in particular, I, I'm with you there. I, I don't think Fenton's in any kind of battle other than with Lonnie Johnson to be the third is my thought especially if Legarius is going to play inside. And I think early on in the season, you want to leave him inside. Maybe you let him play the boundary later. We'll deal with that when it comes. But Keenan Allen in week two, I think Legarius is going to be the nickel corner there uh, where Allen's going to take most of his reps in the slot. So I don't think you get away from that. The question for me is four and five. And, and do they keep six? I don't know if there's enough safety depth on this roster right now to force them to only keep five. I think you can keep 10 DBs and six of them are corners. But it's, it's Baker. It's Boodle. It's the rookie Josh Williams. It is Jalen Watson in the mix. Just from where they're at, who has the edge right now in spots four and five? Yeah, that to me is, I I think it's, you can put a few names into the hat. Um, You know, Jalen Watson really got an awful lot of opportunities. He and Joshua Williams both got a lot lot of shots during OTAs and minicamp. Lonnie Johnson, you know, kind of entered that picture late. But, and I think that was a little bit of even just, you know, the Chiefs were getting the younger guys, you know, some opportunities. But also, again, you know, we didn't have Rashad Fenton out there for any of the offseason workouts due to that shoulder injury. And, and Sneed was not out there for a couple of practices. So some other guys did get did some get some looks. But you're right. I mean, all, all those guys are in the mix. And that's why me that that's going to be a competitive group it's not just four and five it's six and seven and and down and i think that just like the receiver group i mean i think that, that group has got eight or nine guys who could have a legitimate crack at this roster and if even if they're not in the picture on week one day one you know hey you've got still have the 16 player practice squads you know for the future so you know you're gonna have some guys who are gonna be sticking around on this team regardless and they're gonna make this it's just gonna be the pecking order and i, I think that's gonna be a pretty tough you know, fight between that the tire because you've got, you know, some you do have some guys with some experience, but you also have quite a few guys with a huge amount of upside. Experience is, I think, where it comes in because you have the guys that do have experience, they don't have that much of it. They're for the most part on rookie contracts. So that's the thing encouraging to me that I think opens this competition up to the younger guys, the, the rookies and even the second year players, because the vets aren't really vets. They're not second contract guys. They're not guys that have led rooms. I think in the end, it, it becomes Legere Sneed that is a leader amongst this group because they're the, their top player. But it isn't because there's a vast wealth of experience in the room. Yeah, and that's that's the the tricky thing. I mean, you know, you could still look at a guy like a DeAndre Baker uh, simply because he's been around the league for a little bit and and see him as a veteran and maybe having that kind of presence. But at the same time, I mean, you know, when you're backing that up with what you've done on the field, you know, who is really that voice in that cornerback group that can really be the leader? I mean, Snead is at this point the most accomplished and experienced player at the NFL level. I mean, Lonnie Johnson has technically more game experience than Legereus at this point, but he's also bounced around, you know, and and, and hasn't really gotten to claim the position, and it's a brand new team. So, you know, that's the, I mean, and that is the one thing that the cornerback group is, is really lacking, which is a true you know, definitive leader in that group. That's somebody who who's the alpha, who's really going to be able to take charge. And and you know what? That probably means Justin Reed's going to have to do a little bit more of that leadership than even Tyron Matthew had to. Um, Tyron had to do a lot of that because it was a young cornerback room the last few years, but there were still some vets around. I mean, Bashad Breland was around. That helped out. Um, this group is different. I mean, there's not a guy in that room right now with six, seven years of experience that you can lean on. And and even a guy like Snead is a quiet guy. I mean, if, if he's going to lead, I mean, he's going to be more of a, a lead by example kind of a guy, more than a, a raw, raw, get in your face. You know, that's not really his style. So, you know, it's it's a it's a different makeup. And that's why I think that, you know, hey, you look at that that entire cornerback group as and defensive back group as a, as a unit. And that's where I think you have to lean on the guys like Justin Reed and Awan Thornhill a little bit more. 
um, just to, you know, make up for that. And, and it extends to the rest of the defense, too. I mean, Nick Bolton, I think, is going to be a great leader in the NFL on, on a defensive team. But again, one year in the league, I mean, that's not that's not a ton of experience. I, I think we need to talk about Reed. We're going to get to him in the safety group and how they affect the rest of the defense here coming up in a bit because they're part of the, the bigger machine that is the Chiefs defense. And if you need parts, the place you got to go is rockauto.com where you can save up to 100% on your parts for any make model. And it makes it easy because you don't have to wait on them and what they have in stock. You get to go order what you want, save your money, save your time. They're reliable. They've been in business 20 years and they're a family business. It's easy to support them. We hope that you will. If you will check them out, go put everything in your cart at rockauto.com. In that box, right in, locked on on how did you hear about us. That will let them know that we sent you over there to get that amazing selection of reliably low prices and all the car parts or truck parts, in my case, that you're ever going to need over at rockauto.com. Now, thank you. You you made the transition for me on the last segment uh, because I was going there because I don't see the safety depth that maybe we've seen in the last couple of years. It is Reed and Thornhill. Both first contract players still, or no, I'm sorry, Juan's a, a first contract player, but he's towards the end of it. Those guys have a little bit of experience. I, I would call them, you know, baby leaders is kind of how I would term it. But then we're looking at Brian Cook playing a significant role. We're looking at Zane Anderson maybe backing him up. I'm not sure I believe that Deion Bush makes the roster in the top four safety spots. He's the one guy that has a bit more experience. How do you see this safety group shaking out right now? Yeah, and 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 I and I think of that group. I mean, Deion Johnson probably has a pretty good chance solely because of special teams. That that is something that he's head and shoulders about, and that's one of the reasons why the, the Chiefs brought him in. And, and even talking to the people of the you know my sources during the off season, you know, close to the, within the team, they felt like Deion Bush was probably an automatic to make this team just from a special team mm-hmm. standpoint, and that makes sense when you also consider how much turnover of veteran leadership the Chiefs have on the special team side. So that's a guy that Dave Tobe is really, you know, expecting and counting on to be one of his guys. And and you're right. I mean, that then brings in, you know, who is going to be, if you're going to have a, a fifth safety, who is going to be that guy? And yeah, Zane Anderson, Devin Key are both back in that spot. One name, you know, neither one of us has mentioned yet at either one of these spots is Nazi Johnson, you know, a seventh round pick. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure what he is yet because we mm-hmm. saw him getting some work at corner during off season. And so I'm waiting to see, and we get into training camp to see if that was just uh, getting him a little of experience or that is a position that the chiefs feel like he's better suited at this maybe corner than safety uh, and where he fits in, in which case that makes that corner group even more competitive and crowded. Um, but I, I, I think it's safety. It's not a big competition. I mean, I, I think it's fairly well sorted out. It's just going to be how quickly can you get these guys up to speed, you know, cook at, at the number three spot that's somebody the Chiefs are going to use a lot. I mean, your third safety, you're going to use 100% of the time in some games, you know, and it's going to be a guy that's going to be playing 50, 60% of the snaps. And I don't think there's any doubt that the Chiefs would love to get Brian Cook up to speed because, once again, Juan Thornhill is entering that contract year. You draft Brian Cook with the idea he's going to be your starter next week in week one. So, you know, they want him ready and they want him to get some time this year. It's just how quickly can he get there? And so to me, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of competition, but you're right. It is a little bit of how much can you get out of those three, four and five spots, you know, depending on. And like I said, it, I, I think it's I think three and four are probably almost locked up barring injury. It's just whether the Chiefs keep five and who's that's going to be. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's funny. You kind of mentioned it the way that um, is probably best because. Uh, Ryan Nutt and Brett Veach didn't ask me, but Nazi Johnson is a nickel on my evaluation. So we'll see what happens with that. And then that does make it that much more complex. But one more bit of competition is the changing of the guard and the leadership roles. Because uh, I think Chris Jones is still the 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 juice guy, uh, the levity guy. I think Frank Clark, unfortunately, in the way that this has progressed to this point, is probably more isolated than he's ever been on this roster. So I don't know that you can rely on him to push the defense as a unit. So it does fall to new leaders in Nick Bolton and Justin Reed. And it does feel to me like Justin Reed was brought in for partially that aspect of, of really following in Tyron's footsteps, quite literally, not just at the position, but in the leadership role. Does that give you any pause to to two young players being the guys that everyone's looking to on this side of the ball? 
I think normally I think it would, but when it comes to those two guys, I have a lot less concerns than I would be if it were some other players. Um, I think that particularly with Reed coming in, I think he said all the right things. I think he's been doing all the right things. Um, uh, sometimes a player coming into a new position, is, and especially when they know that they're coming in, ex being expected to provide leadership, sometimes they can handle that the wrong way. And, you know, and sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. That certainly does not seem to be the indication with Justin Reed. I mean, it seems like the teammates have really taken to him. Um, he, he's really, I think, done a good job of fitting himself in. And we'll see how that, you know, translates in the beginning of camp. I mean, that's when the things do get a little bit more serious and start to get a little bit more intense. So let's see how that happens. Um, but with Nick Bolton, I think once again, there's a guy that that these guys have gravitated to gravitated to already. Um, you know, it's it's difficult because I think that especially over the last couple of seasons in this pandemic era and everything, you know, the ability of the fans to get to know the players has really been truncated because honestly, the media doesn't get to know him very well either. The only way we really know Nick Bolton is from a podium. And you know what? Some people are not great at podiums. And, and that's been always true. But, you know, we've also always gotten to see these these guys sometimes in a locker room or, you know, just off off to the side. You know, that's that's a different environment. And Nick Bolton, when he's in that linebackers room, I mean, from what I'm told, he's a different guy than what we see at a podium. You know, he's much more confident. He's much more assured. And you see it on a football field and you see it on a mm -hmm. practice field. He's 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 a leader. And once again, I mean, this team has taken to him. They like him. So I, I don't have a lot of concerns. Could there be? young guy mistakes it, because of that youth. Sure. There could be, but uh, honestly, I mean, you know, part of leadership comes from not only knowing what you're doing and doing it right, but being able to do it at a high level. And I think both those guys are going to be able to do that. And, and, and bless Anthony Hitchens heart. He's been a leader the last couple of years, but he's not got the talent that Nick Bolton's got right now at this point in his career. Yeah. I think the the big leap we might see in year two for Nick Bolden is, is not necessarily play on the field, the athleticism. I, I think it will be the setup, the mental aspect, the leadership aspect, things that are more on the sidelines and in the film room and on the practice field than they are on Sundays. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's certainly things that you want to see him improve. I mean, pass coverage is going to be one of those things. And, and I think that during this off season, I think we saw some improvements there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the biggest thing, it was exactly what you said. I mean, is the ability to, you know, to read the, the offenses and make the adjustments pre-snap that they need to, to get guys lined up in the right spot, to do that with confidence, to be able to do it quickly and on the fly. He handled that pretty well last year in, a, in the few the opportunities that he was given, including in a pinch sometimes. And from what I saw during the offseason program, I mean, it, it certainly didn't look like that there were a lot of communication errors or there was any confusion with the defense out there. Let's hope that it stays that way, folks. We only have three more of these sessions with Matt before they're on the field. That's how close it is. Matt, thanks for taking the time in the summer, which should be your break to fill us in. We appreciate it. Absolutely. There's no break for Locked On Chiefs, so there's no break for me here. No, five days a week, folks. We keep on trucking. You all, thanks for being with us. Go check out ChiefsDigest.com to get all the information that Matt's putting out, as well as ours at NFL 33 and Chiefs Corner, uh, the Substacks, uh, Rogue APC. Check out RGR Football. Like, we have it all. It's all still going. So thanks for being with us today. We'll be back with you tomorrow.